Right, good morning Yuri. We're moving on to the third of our villains today. Um, that villain is called Iago and it's from Shakespeare's tragedy Othello, the more of it. I'll be looking at that in a moment. Just by way of reminding you, you should be making a judgement on who you think thus far is the most villainous of our characters. Um, it might be that you think Richard III. Uh, it might be that you think Lady Macbeth. Both of whom are very viable candidates. And you need to be thinking about the reasons why they are particularly villainous and the reasons why we might think they have some other quality qualities which maybe at least gets us to understand their motivations and their motives and why they did things. With the case of Richard III, you could say very, very um, altruistically, which means doing it for the greater good, that he actually did some of the bad things that he did in order to make the country more secure. Um, obviously, that might be historical fact. The reality is that, within the play at least, that actually he was through and through a villain, but with a particular anger at God and the world for making him the way that he was. Is there any excuse in that? Okay. With Lady Macbeth. Um, obviously her love for her husband, wanting to help him fulfil his ambition, is something very much a motivating factor for her. And possibly the influence of the supernatural and the influence that the witches and fate have over her as well. What you'll see is in those two plays, like with other ones of Shakespearean tragedies, like with other ones of Shakespearean tragedies, we say that the particular character, the central character, what we call the protagonist, has a fatal flaw. And that's a term that I've brought up a number of times. It's that one thing about their character which is likely to bring them down, to, to lead to their demise. With Lady Macbeth, Macbeth, sorry, with Macbeth, Macbeth's fatal flaw is his ambition. But that is a theme runs through the whole play. It's about how we deal with our ambition. And we can say, certainly, with the character that we were looking at in that play, Lady Macbeth, that she is full of ambition as well. It's almost like a poison to her. Um, with other ones of the plays, when you've got Hamlet, his fatal flaw is his procrastination, the fact that he doesn't act. And it's that idea which runs through the whole play with all the characters. You've got those people in that play who are people of action, who do things, and those people of words, 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 who talk about doing things. Okay? So it's not just particular to one person. It, it permeates the whole play. When it comes to Othello, the character we are looking at is called Iago. And Othello, character here, um, his fatal flaw is jealousy. He shows some great qualities. He's a general in the army, and I'll talk about where and how that works. Um, he's a very loving husband. He's loyal to his superiors and so on. But there's one trait about him, which is his jealousy, which this character, Iago, plays on. But again, that idea of jealousy permeates the whole of the play. And by permeates, I mean that all of the characters, Iago included, have aspects of jealousy. Okay. Now, I would never say that any of these are excuses for the actions of the villains, particularly when it comes to murder and things like that. But is it something that maybe makes them a little bit more understandable? Okay. So, let's do what we've done for each of these, where we've looked at a few of the posters. And again, you can pause it on these slides and have a look at them yourselves. Um, just to get a few ideas about theme, and issues which actually, again, run through this whole novel, uh, play run. So in this one, obviously, we have a dagger, okay? Just like Lady Macbeth, when she's holding those daggers and those uh, posters which had daggers on there, we can imagine that there is going to be violence in a tragedy, there's likely to be death in a tragedy, okay? We can see here that at the bottom of that dagger, we see a drip of blood, and you can't really see it in there, but there's a character within that drip of blood. Maybe that's something that there is somehow imprisoned by what that blood drop represents, maybe honour or something like that. Very, very importantly, though, you can see that drip of blood there 
has formed itself into the shape of a heart. So is this to do with matters of the heart, to do with love? Um, and as I said with Romeo and Juliet, which is an exploration of the emotion of love, you have love being what we call an oxymoron, which is two contrasting ideas put together for effect, love being bittersweet. And there are wonderful things about feeling love, but obviously, on the flip side of that, the key thing, which is the negative about love, can be jealousy, okay, when love goes wrong. Um, and so maybe we are looking at violence, maybe we are looking at matters of love, and maybe we are looking at what's, when it all goes wrong, jealousy, what can happen, okay? In this one, there is, again, these are terms which you should know. Um, Shakespeare very famously has personified uh, jealousy, okay? And the, I'm just looking for my old marker. When we talk about personification, it's when we give an inanimate or a non-living thing living qualities. In this case, it's an emotion. And the emotion which he personifies is jealousy, and he calls that the green-eyed monster. Literally, when something takes us over when we get jealous. That's a very visceral, very, very raw, emotional, physical thing that takes us over when we get that sort of sense of jealousy inside. Okay, it's an anger growing, it's, it's pain, it's hurt, it's many, many things. So when he personifies jealousy, he calls it the green-eyed monster, which is what that represents. You can also see in that one this idea of people being caught in a web. Now, I spoke about Richard III particularly, being what we call the Machiavell, or someone who is Machiavellian. And if you are Machiavellian, it means essentially not only are you willing to do anything in order to achieve your objectives, but equally you quite take a great deal of pleasure in plotting and scheming. Now, Richard obviously did that. He created this web of lies, this web of intrigue. Iago, the character we're looking at today, does very much the same thing. And I'll be looking at quotations from him, which actually say that he is creating this web of lies, okay, and deceit. What other themes are we looking at? Well, one clear theme here is we can assume this is the hand of a woman, and this is the hand of a man, the woman is white, the man is black. So even in 16th century uh, Elizabethan England, and more broadly when we actually look at where this play takes place, there were issues of racism, there was issues of prejudice. Uh, and Othello, the character, is what we call a Moor, uh, and the Moorish Empire was across North Africa. So Othello is black. His wife, his young wife, Desdemona is white. And right from Act 1, Scene 1, we see that as an issue in the play. Um, obviously here we have blood, a trickle of blood. But what does that represent to us? In here you can see that she is holding a handkerchief. And on that handkerchief we can see this tiny little uh, image here, which is of a strawberry. Okay, how relevant is that? You could even, if you were analysing this very, very deeply, with someone holding somebody else's hand, sometimes that can be a sign of affection, but sometimes it is very much this sign of ownership, possession, mine. Okay? And if you think about the context of what I said before of female characters in Shakespeare, what made Lady Macbeth so unconventional was the fact that she, initially, Act 1, Scene 5 of that particular play, was very much the lead character. She was in charge of her husband. Okay? Desdemona, Othello's wife, it's not the case. She's a more typical female character. I'm not saying she's not strong, but she is somewhat subservient, submissive to her husband. And I get this idea here with that hand holding her that is very much about Othello controlling Desdemona. Um, this image here, we are talking about matters of the heart again. Maybe we are talking about love. But, and again, do you remember this word that I've spoken about a number of times called motif? A motif is a repeated idea or image. 
We have it in uh, Hamlet. Throughout Hamlet, it's talked about there's a contagion, there's a disease around Denmark where the play takes place, which is a poison. And that poison is actually the corrupt king, Hamlet's uncle called Claudius. We'll talk about him next week. Um, in Macbeth, you have Lady Macbeth saying that I may pour my spirits in thine ear, literally poison uh, through telling her husband what he should be doing. It's poison entering his system. And similarly here, we've got this image of a snake. Um, and do you remember Lady Macbeth in our previous play, he said, look like the serpent, sorry, look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. This idea of people acting what they are not. And these motifs come up again and again throughout these Shakespeare tragedies. This idea of poison somehow working its way into somebody's heart, and that is about jealousy. Um, similarly, people not being what they appear, disguises is a common motif as well. Okay. So all these ideas we can start looking at when we come to the play. Um, right. Looking at some images of Iago, I think I'll wait on, because I just want to go to this. This one. This is where the t play takes place. It's in 16th century. Okay, it's in Venice, which is in northeastern Italy. Amazing city. Um, if you ever get a chance to visit it, do go. You can see from this that Venice is not even an island. It's built, well, it's not a, a natural island. It's built in a lagoon at the top of the Adriatic Sea. Um, and it's built literally on wooden stilts. And you can see... You know, that you have various islands and you have canals absolutely networking those islands, okay? The Grand Canal going up here and so on, okay? But it's absolutely meshed, a network of canals, which is absolutely appropriate symbolically. If you think about what I said in terms of Iago creating this net, this, this mesh, if you like, of, of lies and intrigue and untruths, this is quite an appropriate place for it to take place. And you can see here, these are images painted at the time. You've got the canals, everyone goes about on gondolas and boats, okay? Um, but it's a very, very sort of insular place. Venice in the 16th century was a very powerful place as well. Um, obviously, religion at the time was very, very important. But if you go to Venice, not only have you got what we call the Basilica of St. Mark, which is a big church, which is stunning, but right next door to it, you have the palace of, of the local doge, who was like a duke. And all of Venice's power was based on trade, on merchants, and a navy. Um, and obviously sometimes they had to protect themselves um, because people wanted the riches that they had. And that's where Othello comes in, and Othello is a general in the Venetian, Venice's army. Okay. So that is, if you like, a little bit of context to it. Uh, Iago is what we call an ensign, which is a lower officer. Okay? Let's just go back. He's a lower officer to Othello. He should be absolutely loyal to Othello. In this motif of disguises, he's always there at Othello's side. Should be loyal to him, just like Banquo is to... Um, Macbeth, but you can see when I talked about this idea, this theme of jealousy, it's not just to do with jealousy of love, it's to do with other reasons. And is that Iago's motivation? Now, if you look at these images, here we have Othello and here we have Iago. And just like with Lady Macbeth and Macbeth, we can see him whispering, pouring his spirits into Othello's ear. And what he was always saying to him, among other lies that he told, is you need to watch this other man called Cassio, because he and your wife are getting a bit too close. They're having an affair. Okay? You can also maybe see in this one that actually Othello is deeply, deeply in love with his young wife Desdemona. Okay? And that is something that Iago doesn't have. He's married. Um, 
to Amelia, but he doesn't really have a great relationship with her one based on love and trust. And so there might be a jealousy of simply what he has. It's not that he particularly likes Desdemona, but he's jealous of what they have. You can see the fact in this image, you've got Iago and Othello again, the pain that he is putting Othello through by telling him his lies. And you can see it here as well. In this image, you always get this idea of him being constantly behind him. There's something very, very sinister about Iago. And finally, in this image, we have him as the puppeteer again, the Machiavel. Remember that word I came, I was and told you about? The idea of someone who is manipulating other characters. And just as in that poster from Macbeth, you have fate manipulating Macbeth. So in this one, you have the character of Iago manipulating all the other characters. Now, the reason why I say all this is is you could ask the question, why? Why does he do it? Why does he choose to actually bring down his friend uh, and, and jeopardise the lives and destroy the lives of many people? And that's constantly what we you know, are asking. Why does Lady Macbeth do it? Well, we get an idea. Why does Richard III do it? We get an idea, because they want the throne. The Argo doesn't think in that way. And at the end of the play, when he's asked why, there is simply the answer, well, because. Because I can. Um, and it could be we're meant to read in between the lines there. But for me, personally, does that beg the question, does it make him more of a villain, simply to destroy things because he can, rather with a particular objective in mind? Okay? Just so you get an idea of relationships, because it's quite a complex story, as you imagine it would be. Um, we have, obviously, Othello here, and he is married to Desdemona. Okay? Desdemona's father is called Brabantia. Okay? She is friends with, but no more than friends with, uh, a soldier who Othello promotes over Iago called Cassio. And Cassio has a girlfriend called Bianca. We have another character called Rodrigo, who is desperately in love with Desdemona, but she does not feel the same way. Iago, the character we are talking about, is always trying to manipulate things. He uses Rodrigo to get to Othello. He uses Cassio to get to Othello. And unfortunately, the thing that he uses to get to Othello through is Desdemona. Rodrigo loves her, she does not love him, but he tries to promote his affections for her, and he lies about his relationship with her. Okay? And then we have Iago's wife called Amelia. And she does not particularly, even though she's married to him, she does not particularly love her husband. All right? Now, a key quotation, that the reason why I've gone through that, is he says, Iago says, at one point, I shall enmesh them all. And enmesh means net, so I shall trap them all in a net of his deceit. Okay? All right, we'll leave it there just for 10 minutes. I'll come back to it.